June 2024, deep in central Uganda, a cluster of small farms are buzzing. A farmer taps an app on his smartphone. Sensors buried in the soil send moisture data. A drone hovers overhead taking images. He's about to decide whether to water, whether to spray, or whether to wait and his decisions will determine whether his harvest lives or fails. But here's the twist. The technology guiding him wasn't built in Silicon Valley, and it didn't come from Europe. It was devised in India, and Uganda is quietly letting India steer the future of its agriculture and ICT infrastructure over Western models that once dominated aid and tech. Why did Uganda tilt toward India? What's driving this shift? And what could it mean for Africa's independence in food and tech? Let's start with what is happening now and then rewind to how this partnership mutated from foreign aid to strategic alliance. In April 2025, Uganda and India pledged to deepen cooperation. They weren't talking about bailouts or one-time grants. They spoke of moose in agriculture, ICT, infrastructure, and exchanging tech and digital infrastructure. This is critical. Uganda isn't just begging for help. It is negotiating on equal footing. Uganda knows that its previous relationships, particularly with Western donors and institutions often, came with strings, rigid funding rules, conditionalities, and sometimes a mismatch with local needs. India, by contrast, is positioning itself as a tech and solution partner, not just an owner. Its pitch, we understand small farms, we built our success with constraints, we can help you leap, Uganda is listening, but how did this relationship go from symbolic to structural? To see that, we need to go deeper into the roots of their historical ties, India and Uganda share over a century of connection. In the early 20th century, Indian merchants and immigrants settled in Uganda, becoming central to trade. However, in 1972, a dark turn, dictator Idi Amin expelled tens of thousands of Asians, many of Indian origin from Uganda, severing much of the commercial fabric. That rupture left scars, but over time, many Indian families returned. Indian businesses re-established themselves in sugar, manufacturing, and trade. The Medvani and Meta groups, with roots in India, built sugar production in Uganda that persists today. So what was once broken is being remade not as nostalgia, but as a strategic. Realignment, Uganda sees potential in tapping Indian industrial know-how, networks, and less paternalistic stance, India sees a testbed for its agricultural innovations. Yet the leap from trading sugar to trusting India with tech in your soil requires proof, enter the pilot projects and tech deployments. A few examples show how India's agriculture tech is creeping into Ugandan soil. In 2021, India introduced a cotton picking machine, the Kapas Plucker, to Kasizi district in Uganda, that machine amplifies efficiency in cotton harvest, cutting labor intensity, Indian ag tech companies that build light, durable tractors easily repairable in rural settings are gaining traction in Africa. Uganda is watching. The same design logic that made tractors successful in Indian smallholds fits Uganda's landscape. Meanwhile, in Uganda itself, digital transformation in agriculture is underway. In districts like Luero, Nakasiki, and Mukono, farmers now send photos of diseased crops via WhatsApp and receive diagnostic previews and advice. One youth, agripreneur trained 50 young people in digital advisory tools leading to a 20% yield bump for tomatoes. In academic circles, Ugandan researchers propose IAT frameworks for climate-resilient maize farming soil sensors, moisture monitoring, predictive models. Another project builds a real-time environmental sensor network for general crops. But deploying tech is only part, the question, can it scale? And will Ugandan farmers not only use but trust Indian models rather than Western ones? Because there are deeper forces in play, one of the biggest pivots, Uganda is trying to turn farmer data into financial power. In 2024, a feasibility study looked at aggregating fragmented agri-data across platforms to unlock data-driven credit and insurance. Imagine. Your soil moisture, pest history, input purchases, yields all in one profile, used to underwrite alone. But that requires trust. Who owns the data? Who ensures it's not misused or skewed to favor foreign companies? Uganda faces a delicate balancing act. Allow outside players to build the platform or risk alienating farmers by over-centralizing. India's strength is that many of its tech firms are comfortable working modularly, providing APIs, interoperable platforms, open designs, that gives Uganda more leverage than older Western models which often lock you in. In the recent India-Uganda talks, ICT infrastructure, data exchange, and standards were expressly on the table. But those data flows open vulnerabilities, cybersecurity, privacy, local control. Uganda is trying to negotiate clauses to ensure that data stays local. 
that it isn't repurposed without consent, and that locally trained personnel manage maintenance. We'll revisit how this battle over control is central. Uganda is not a passive recipient. It has its own homegrown innovators, and some are pushing back against foreign blueprints, takes Telenakaria, a young Ugandan entrepreneur who developed a solar-powered tick detector to monitor livestock disease. She has part of a new wave. Uganda's youth using ICT plus agriculture to solve local problems. Her work signals that Uganda's future tech owners may come from within not just imports. And at research centers like NARO, crop breeders are modernizing breeding programs using genomic selection, digital tracking, and local priority setting. But there's friction. Farmers accustomed to Western donors may mistrust Indian intentions. Some question whether Indian tech will overshadow local knowledge. Others fear over dependence or hidden costs. Moreover, scaling these pilot innovations requires bridging infrastructure gaps, power, connectivity, maintenance, training. The best technology means nothing if rural Uganda cannot sustain it. Still, government choices are leaning India's way. Why? Because the economic terms are more flexible and the tech model is more compatible. Historically, Western powers USA, UK, EU institutions were the dominant players in Africa's development era funding agriculture, imposing standards, directing curricula, controlling tech transfer. But times have changed. Many Western programs came. With inflexible rules, you had to buy certain brands, follow particular standards, or use certain contractors. That rigidity often clashed with local realities. Uganda seeks flexibility. India seems more willing to let local adaptation happen. India's own journey from famine fighting to green revolution gives it credibility. India understands constraints, small plots, soil degradation, monsoon dependency. It created scalable, low-cost solutions. Uganda sees that as more relatable than Western concepts built for large commercial farms. Indian tech often emphasizes repairability and modular parts fixed local parts. Western tech sometimes assumes global supply chains. In rural Uganda, waiting for spare parts from abroad means downtime. Indian models reduce that risk. Uganda wants diverse partnerships. Aligning heavily with Western powers can carry geopolitical strings. India's approach less ideological, more project-based gives Uganda more freedom in domestic policy choices. If Indian firms succeed, in Uganda, they'll replicate models across Africa. Uganda becomes a showcase. Uganda is staking on being an early mover, not a follower. But this is not a clean break from the West. Uganda is still working with Western owners in many sectors. Its decision is, in agriculture tech and ICT, it's tilting India's way now, from a soil sensor in Luero, to data platforms debated in Kampala boardrooms, to tractors rolling across fields. Uganda's decision to lean toward India is not whimsical, it is strategic, leveraging a partner whose strengths align with Uganda's constraints and aspirations. Uganda gains access to scalable, adaptable tech less ideological pressure, and the possibility to own its own systems. The risks remain real dependency, control over data and infrastructure gaps, but Uganda appears to believe that the upside is worth the gamble. For Africa, Uganda's path might be a blueprint. If this partnership succeeds, it could shift how developing nations choose tech alliances not by donor brand, but by angle, flexibility, and compatibility. In the end, the question isn't t whether India or the West is better at a switch partner lets Uganda write its own tech future from the ground up, and in that sense, the rains, the sensors, and the seeds will answer.